All right, part B, lecture 10, let's dive in. At the end of the last uh, lecture, lecture A, we took a look at Portuguese exploration. As da Gama, well, first Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope and then da Gama reached India for Portugal, huge event. And I think we underestimate it because we get so fixated on Columbus, but that rounding of the Cape of Good Hope changed global commerce forever. Momentous achievement of the Portuguese. Columbus has an alternative idea. Let's sail west and not go around the continent of Africa. I'll reach Asia from the west. And at the time, it was not taken too seriously. And it had never been done before. Well, the Vikings did it, but uh, that information was lost. And, and there wasn't much of an understanding of what had happened a few centuries earlier with the Vikings. So Columbus has this plan. I'm going to sail west. He approached um, the king of Portugal in 1485. Portugal refused to uh, go with the idea. Then he went to England in 1487, same result, no buyer. Went back to Portugal, 1488, still can't find anyone to, uh, to finance and to sponsor his expedition. Columbus, by the way, was Italian. He was from Genoa. And then finally in 1492, of course, Ferdinand and Isabella financed this epic trip um, it was a daring trip. It took a, a ton of bravery and courage to embark on that trip. Much more bravery and courage than, than uh, any of us probably have. And, and they loaded up the three ships and, and crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Hit the Canary Islands, Bahamas, north, northern coast of Cuba, and Hispaniola. And then eventually Columbus makes three more voyages. Here's a map of those voyages. And on these voyages in, in these Caribbean islands, one of the things that Columbus immediately notices is that there's gold. There's gold. He doesn't, he hasn't found the source of that gold, but he notices that the indigenous people are wearing gold jewelry, gold rings on their and their arms, gold earrings and uh, gold nose rings, and that the natives are very willing to trade those gold items for European items that are very common in the old world, but the indigenous people in the Caribbean had never seen before. And so Columbus is, in Columbus's diary, he notes how one of the indigenous people traded a bar of gold for a needle, a needle. And, uh, now, from the perspective of that, uh, the the man who did that trade, um, it made sense. You know, there's he, they've got gold. They've, they've never seen a needle before, and a needle has a lot of utility, so it seemed like a fair exchange. Um, but Columbus notes this in his diary. That there, there's gold here, and writes back to the king of Spain, and that begins to build some interest in further explorations in this area. And, and people begin to figure out, wait, this isn't Asia. This is something totally different. Now, whether or not Columbus figured that out by the end of his life in 1506 or not, uh, uh, but by the first end of the first decade in the 16th century, this is clear. This is a new, a new continent. Of course, the uh, indigenous people in the uh, in these islands uh, suffered quite a bit. There was there were flagrant acts of cruelty and murder. Um, the vast majority of them, vast majority of them die of disease. And that will also tragically um, uh, beset the peoples of Mexico and, and really all over America. There were about 70 million Native Americans around the year 1500. And uh, disease far and away was was the, uh, the, the killer. The old world, those, the old world had been exposed to these diseases for thousands of years. The Black Death in the 14th century had killed an estimated 200 million people in Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe. The old world has all this immunity and exposure to all these old diseases. None of that in, uh, in the Americas. And, and it's a very uh, extremely tragic story of what, of what happened. But this, so now this new world opened up. Here are some early maps. 
to the Caribbean known quite well, and then a little bit of the outer edge of South America, and that's about it. There's another map. Short, I believe this is from about 1520. 1519, Hernan Cortez and the Spanish invade Mexico. This is a Mexican currency, and you see Cortez on that 1,000 uh, peso note. Hernan Cortez invades Mexico, and what he finds is a highly advanced, elaborate civilization, the Aztec Empire, and this Aztec Empire, the seat of that empire is in a city called Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan, and, and if you read the diaries of Cortez and, uh, and his men, Bernal Diaz, their description of Tenochtitlan is absolutely incredible. Besides the pyramid structures, Tenochtitlan had marketplaces and then he's had a, a, a market economy, um, uh, sophisticated uh, buildings, houses, trading squares where tens of thousands of people traded every day. The marketplace included earthenware, maize, food, different foods, copper, brass, medicinal herbs, sugar, wine. Uh, they even noted barber shops uh, on occasion in some of the in some of the marketplaces. Gold and silver ornaments, gold and silver ornaments, and jewelry, and it was very clear the Aztecs greatly prized and found much beauty in gold and silver, but used only for ornamental purposes, used only as a, a sacred object. Here's uh, some more depictions of Tenochtitlan. They had a money, or two kinds of money. But it wasn't gold and silver. So the, this is interesting. They, they highly prized gold and silver, but gold and silver was not their money. Their money was cacao beans, cacao beans and cotton capes or uh, quackly. Cacao beans was the most, most common currency and it was a relatively successful currency. It was very, it was portable, durable, had intrinsic value. The cacao beans arrived from distant lowland areas and they were brought into central Mexico via a, a costly trade route. And cacao beans had quite a bit of value. And in fact, if you wanted to uh, enjoy the drink produced by many of these cacao beans, you had to be of uh, some of a, the nobility. So it, it possesses a fairly high ratio of, of value for its uh, comparatively small size. But then also they used cotton capes or quackly, and these cotton capes, they were regulated by different sizes and grades of, of cotton. And, and each grade had a corresponding value in cacao beans. And so uh, the different grades, 65 cacao beans for one cotton cape, 80 cacao beans for another, 100 cacao beans for, for the next one up, and it, and it kept going on up. And then the highest grade of cotton capes were worth 300 cacao beans. And so this was another item of trade in the marketplace. Like I said, gold and silver were used strictly for ornamental and ornamental purposes and, and uh, sacred purposes. There's a cacao bean, um, the harvesting of cacao beans. Now the emperor, Montezuma, uh, also greatly prized gold and silver and some of the descriptions of, of what he had, quite incredible. And uh, Montezuma brought the uh, Spaniards into his palace, invited them into his palace. And the Spaniards came into the palace in the descriptions. He said Montezuma, first of all, was just covered in gold, golden sandals, gold, a big giant golden belt. And then inside the palace, which is gold from floor to ceiling of gold. One later, Aztec source said that when the Spaniards entered that palace and saw what they saw, they, quote, grinned like little beasts and patted each other with delight. Quote, they hungered like pigs for that gold. 
So here, the Spaniards come in, and they know how valuable gold is. Gold in the old world is money, and, and it's incredibly valuable. It's obviously very valuable to the Aztecs, too, but in a different sort of way, not as money. And the Spaniards, they see that, and, it's, and, and this is where the greed, the human depravity, the depravity of man, the human, the, the radical corruption of mankind really comes into play. And they see that gold and, and cannot seem to help themselves. Got to take this. We've got to take down a civilization. And one thing they know to their advantage is that the Aztecs have a lot of enemies locally. The Aztecs were a very brutal people toward surrounding Central American peoples and were known to uh, uh, conquer and make enemies of foreign lands, enslaved many of the peoples in those lands, and were known for human sacrifice, notorious for human sacrifice. In fact, the dedication of the Great uh, Pyramid in Tenochtitlan in 1487, the Aztecs themselves claimed to have sacrificed in a four-day period 80,000 victims that they had taken from from these areas. And so the Aztecs are hated by many of the surrounding indigenous peoples. The Spaniards take advantage of that, ally with the Aztecs' enemies. And so even though the Spaniards are vast, vastly outnumbered, if you take the Spaniards versus all of the indigenous people, the indigenous people themselves are divided. And so the Spaniards, so you could say divide and conquer and, and exploit this, this division in native society and take down the Aztec Empire. Aztec Empire falls in 1521. You'll notice in this drawing, you have Spaniard, a Spaniard here, and then indigenous warriors allied with the Spaniards to take down, to take down the Aztecs. So brutality meets brutality, and, and that is the end of the, the Aztec Empire. And, and in the aftermath, the Spaniards now conquered Mexico and the Spaniards quickly make it very clear that they are every bit as brutal as the Aztecs that they had replaced. And they go from city to from town to town, um, wreaking havoc over much of Mexico in a search for gold. To get as much gold as possible, just plundering much of the land. And in fact, later, uh, Bartolomeu uh, de las Casas, of course, writes his uh, Destruction of the Indies. Uh, he was a Catholic priest in Spain who was horrified uh, by uh, what the Spaniards were doing there for this, again, this lust for money. This lust for money can do really terrible things. Terrible things. A little bit later, the Spaniards also take down the Incan Empire, the Inca Empire in present-day Peru, falls in 1533 to um, Francisco Pizarro. The Inca, likewise, had many gold and silver ornaments. Many, many gold and silver ornaments. But did not use them as money. Pizarro and the Spaniards took the Incan emperor, Atahualpa, and uh, ambushed the Inca, took him hostage, in 1532, the Inca offered a ransom for his release. They said, we'll give you two rooms of silver and one room of gold. The Spaniards agreed to the, to the exchange. And then with the ransom in hand, the Spaniards reneged on the bargain and, and executed the emperor. So again, just acts of extreme cruelty. Again, I would say out of, this is the wickedness, the, the wicked side of money. The wicked side of money. And lest you think uh, this is unique to the Spaniards, um, this is a, a problem that plagues, I argue, all, all human beings. Um, this, just this lust for power and for money. It's powerful, and it, uh, it can do some really nasty things. The ransom, which they kept, obviously, even though they reneged on it, Seven tons of gold and 13 tons of silver. Seven tons of gold and 13 tons of silver. Pizarro is also on, uh, on Spanish currency. 1545, 
their former Inca Empire, former Inca Empire, the Spaniards discover that there is a giant mountain, giant mountain at Potosi, and Potosi is actually in present-day Bolivia, but back then it was part of the Spanish, it's called the Vice Royalty of Peru, and at this silver mountain, just inestimable sums, uh, quantities of silver, giant, giant fount of silver there in Peru, more than you can possibly imagine. We'll look at that more next week. But that's right there in the former Inca Empire. Um, Spaniards aren't going to do the labor in these mines. Mining is a really, really hard work, as we've seen in previous lectures. And so the Spaniards recruit, forcibly recruit, natives to work these mines. It's called the encomienda, the system. At first, the Spanish tried to pay wages, but nobody, uh, the conditions were so harsh that nobody wanted to work in these mines. And so a forced labor system in which men um, were conscripted 17 weeks out of the year in order to work the mines and the, the conditions of these mines were uh, quite, quite horrendous, as you can probably imagine. Some of the shafts going down into, into this, this mine at Potosi went 700 feet, 700 feet. Um, some of the fumes from the mercury, which was used to, uh, to separate the silver from the, from the rest of the ore, uh, was uh, poisonous. Um, the 700 foot shafts, uh, rock falls, uh, could kill or maim hundreds of people. Um, and just long, long hours at, uh, digging with um, sacks of ore tied to their back. Uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, nasty, terrible conditions in these in these mines. But the the output was again. You'll see in these statistics. You can't overestimate how huge this is to monetary history. This is the estimated supply of silver worldwide in the year 1500. 35,000 tons, 35,000 tons worldwide in 1500. In America alone, and there were some silver mines also in Mexico, but silver is going to be the big one. So I was talking a lot about gold and assets, but silver is the biggie, right? Silver is the big of the two is, and there's a gold mines too. Gold's being produced in America, but silver especially. Look at this. In just a 50-year period, 17,000 tons of silver are mined from America alone, mostly from Potosi in Peru. This is Bolivia right here, but uh, again, that was included in the vice royalty of Peru. And then look at this. Unbelievable. 42,000 tons of silver produced, so added to the world supply of silver in the 17th century. 42,000 tons. And then... The 18th century, 74,000 tons, 74,000 tons of silver produced in the 18th century in America alone. Unbelievable. On average, at Potosi, 300 tons of silver were produced every year. And so, you know, we're going to we're going to stop there. And um, but this is going to have enormous consequences for global trade it's going to temporarily bring spain to just unimaginable heights as far as the the geopolitical the geopolitics in europe it's also going to be a source of spain's downfall so spain is very cruel in the new world but then the the uh, object of that cruelty or the uh, uh, the object that they that they seized in, in for that cruelty then becomes the source of their own downfall. That all this silver and all this gold that Spain brings in is actually going to harm Spain at the end by the end of it. Uh, quite an ironic story, but we're going to have to wait till next week to uh, to touch on that.